we are going to continue our time together tonight in uh, Philippians chapter four. We're going to be reading verses four, or excuse me, verses ten through nineteen tonight, and um, um, we're going to work through this a little bit. The idea of contentment. There's there's so much before we get into the text. There's so much that could be said tonight, but there are really just three main things that I want to talk about as it relates to. Um, growing in contentment. And so um, tonight we're going to begin reading the text in Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 10. This is what Paul writes. He says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret to being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or living in want. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. As you know, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I was first when I first brought you the good news and then traveled on to Macedonia. No other church did this. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you helped me more than once. I don't say this because I want a gift from you. Rather, I want you to receive a reward for your kindness. At that moment, at the moment, I have all that I need and more. I am generously supplied with the gifts you have sent me with uh, Epaphroditus. They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul is writing this letter to the church at Philippi. And at this point in Paul's ministry, he's legendary. He's in prison in Rome, but the known world, even non-Christians, are familiar with this man named Paul at this point. Paul has been homeless, but he was powerful in the giftings of God. He had been without food, and he had been with food, but the entire time, like, the anointing of the Spirit just carried him along. And so Paul reveals something here. He says that um, there, was, there were, have been times in his life where he has had financial needs. Now, in Paul's mind, what a financial need is, is not to have money in my wallet, but it's to have food on my plate. Okay, so he's saying that there have been times where uh, I have had to go without. There have been times where I've not had food or I've not had clothing or I've, you know, I've been naked at one point, he says. He has had needs in his life. And he says, at a certain point in my ministry, you guys sent me a gift. When I was, when I moved on to Macedonia, you guys sent a gift. And man, I was so incredibly grateful for that gift. And what Paul says in the very beginning, just for clarity, he says, I'm so thankful that your, your concern for me has been renewed. It almost, if you read it in the wrong uh, translation, it almost seems like Paul's like, well, finally, you know, I've been waiting for a while and you guys are just coming around. Like, that's what it seems like Paul's doing, but that's not really what he's saying. Okay, I don't know. Paul was a little you know, spicy. No, I'm kidding. That's not what he's saying at all. But what Paul was saying is he's saying, listen, I realized that you wanted to, but you just didn't have the opportunity to do it, okay? And so locally at the Church of Philippi, there were financial struggles over the past 10 years. They, you know, the, the nation or the empire had kind of gone through a famine in different pockets. There were, there were little civil wars that were breaking out on the fringes. There were a lot of things going on. And Paul says, and, and listen, I'm, I'm thankful that you guys are at least able to send another gift. And what Paul's saying here is he's saying, listen, I, I'm so grateful that your, your concern for me has manifested itself. Now you have the means and the, the depths of your love for me is now manifest and that you're able to give something to me. It wasn't that Paul was unthankful. That's not what he was saying, okay? What he was saying is that I'm so grateful for what you've given and my soul is content even if you could not have given it to me. This is what F.B. Meyer wrote. He said, Paul was depraved of every comfort at this stage in his life. 
and cast as a lonely man on the shores of the great strange metropolis, Rome, with every moment of his hand clanking a fetter and nothing better, excuse me, nothing before him but the lion's mouth or the sword. This is what he's saying. He's saying, listen, at this point, Paul is receiving this gift, but you've got to understand at this point in his life, he, it was a moment of desperation. He knew that at any moment he could stand before Nero and Nero could say off with his head or send him to the lions. He knew that, but even in the midst of that, he wasn't whining about his circumstances. He was content. He was filled with gratitude for these things. But this is where I kind of want to focus our attention tonight. This is what Paul says. He says, I have learned the secret to being content. He's saying contentment is like this elusive trait that's out there. A lot of people don't have it, but when you find someone that's truly content, like not only with what their material possessions are, which that's where we're going to focus our attention tonight, but when they're content in their soul, when they're content with their purpose in life, when they're a content person, you can pick up on it, but you can't just take it from them. It's one of those things that it's very elusive. You don't really understand like where it comes from or where it goes because it's so rare. It's so uncommon. It's difficult to attain, but Paul says it is attainable and you can learn how to possess contentment. You can learn to have a disposition and an attitude of the heart that says in this situation, even though it's crappy, I am good and I am thankful for what I do have, not desiring the things that I don't have, right? And so tonight I want to talk to you about three different ways that we can learn contentment in our lives, okay? The first way is this. Number one, I believe that contentment can be learned in famine, okay? This is the idea that contentment can be learned when a person has less than, than what they desire, right? When things are really difficult time, they can be content even though they may have needs that are greater. They, they can learn to be settled in what they are. You guys have probably, over the past 10 years or so, you've, you've heard of these people. They're called minimalists. Have you heard this? And this is the, the idea that, you know, they go in their house and they're like, we don't need pictures on the wall and I only need one bowl. Why do I need more than one bowl? I can eat cereal and chili out of the same bowl. I'll just wash it. And so they get rid of all their dishes except for, you know, however many people are in the house and They've got, you know, uh, one pair of shoes and one pair of underwear, you know, just on and on and on. They have, they have reduced their lives and their mindset is simply this. I don't need all the stuff that I may want. Okay. Now I'm not saying that every minimalist, I'm not saying that we should become minimalist. All I'm simply saying is this, is that most minimalists have adopted a mentality that even though I don't have a lot. I'm content with not having a lot. As a matter of fact, I prefer not having a lot, okay? And again, I'm not saying that's how we should live, but what I am saying is this, is that there is a mass confusion in Western culture as we delineate the difference between wants and needs in our individual lives. There's, there's, it's, it, it's a massive gray area, right? We say that there are things that we need that in actuality we don't need. They're just wants, right? Now, contextually, Paul is, is, is talking about, um, you remember, he's coming out of the section where he's talking about how we, we use our thoughts and the things that we focus on and all of these kind of things. Well, this portion of text kind of feeds into the way that we think about things and the way that we think about the things that we have and the way that we think about the things that we want. But the reality for most of us, my, myself included, okay, is that there are a lot of things that I believe that I need. I think they are needs in my life, but the reality is they are actually just wants in my life, okay? So last year, I, for whatever reason, I, I, uh, I got on this thing where 
I just started focusing. I told my wife, I'm like, you know what? I, I need to get a truck. I love to have a truck. I love to hunt and do all this stuff. So, so I love to have a truck to haul stuff away and all this. And um, I, I have a great vehicle. I'm so thankful, you know, for, for what I have and everything. But there was just something going on in me where I was just like, dude, I've got to get it. I've got to get a truck, you know? And so everywhere that I go, I'm like looking and everybody, it, it seems like every vehicle that passes me is a truck. Right. And I'm just like, oh, I really like that, you know, and I could I could do with that and all these types of things. And as I tracked it down, this is what I began to realize. I had been spending time during hunting season with a group of friends and everybody had been talking about getting uh, like the guys who didn't have a truck were talking about getting a truck. And what I realized is I traced back my thoughts. I was like, dude, this is like inception. Right? There has is, there is unconsciously been like a seed that's been planted into my mind, and the seed is now telling me that I need to get a truck. Well, did I need a truck? No, my vehicle's fine. It's actually paid off. I definitely don't need a car payment, okay? But my mind was telling me, nope, this isn't good enough. This is what you need, when in actuality, I didn't need it. It was just something that I absolutely wanted, Okay, so again, it's about how we think about needs and wants. It's how we make the distinction between the things that we want and the things that we need. Okay, so for instance, um, this is how powerful our thoughts are and how powerful the influence are around us, depending on where you find yourself in your friendship circles and socioeconomic, you know, relationships or whatever. Okay, if you're in a situation where you are, I don't know, you're, you're in a situation where you can't get up and go to the bathroom, okay? And you're sitting there with one of your friends and all of a sudden they're like, man, I have got to pee so bad, right? And you're just like, well, it'll be fine another three hours and you'll be able to go to the bathroom, right? And then all of a sudden after a few minutes, you hear your friend say it a couple of more times and then all of a sudden you're like, would you please be quiet? Now I have to go to the bathroom, right? It's the power of suggestion. And then all of a sudden, I feel like I need to do this thing when in actuality, I probably don't need to. It's a psychological thing that, that has happened to us, okay? Now, this is the same thing as it relates to our needs and our wants as far as it relates to material things, okay? So for instance, um, as we look at the globe, okay? As we look at the globe, did you realize that the average annual income, the average annual income across the globe is less than $3,000? That includes people who have nothing, and it includes the Jeff Bezos of the world, okay? If you take all of that, you divvy it out, you average it out, the average person in the world lives off of $3,000 per year, right? As Americans, you can't live off $3,000 a year, okay? Well, I guess there are certain ways, but you, you sh it's, it's very unlikely, okay? It's a lot more difficult to live off $3,000 is what I'm trying to say. But in our, in our system, what we start saying is, well, I've got to make this amount of money so that I can have all of the things that I need, right? But the reality is that what we're looking at when we call things our needs is we're looking at what other people have that we want, right? You understand, like, the basis of what we need as human beings can be wrapped up really in three different things, right? Food, water, shelter, okay? These three things are the basic human elements that we need to survive, okay? This is why when you watch these survival shows, one of the first things they're trying to do is secure water. Then secondly, they're trying to secure shelter, and then they're trying to secure food. It's because those are the three things that they need to survive, okay? But what we have done in Western culture is we have said, nope, I don't just need this, I also need a truck, right? And so we, we, we live in this environment where, where, you know, there is an abundance and it has really crippled us in a lot of ways. And so what I'm saying is, is that um, 
even though we live in such a place like this, we have to discipline ourselves to be people that, that grow in our contentment, right? So this is what I would challenge you to do with this. I would challenge you, not right now, but later when you get home. I would challenge you to take a piece of paper, draw a line down the middle on one side, one column, write needs, on another side of the column, write wants. And I would challenge you to truly and honestly, you know, dictate out all the things that you believe are needs and wants. This is relational. This is, you know, uh, clothing. This is vehicles. This is, you know, what you, you believe you need or want in a church or, you know, all of these different things. If you really begin to step back and be honest about it, what you will begin to see is that I have such a greater amount of wants than I actually have needs. Okay. Now, let me be clear about this. I don't think there's anything wrong with having wants. I don't think there's anything wrong. I want a lot of things. Okay. There's nothing wrong with that as long as they have their proper place, right? But the moment that our wants begin to dictate and lead our lives, there's a problem. We need to recalibrate recalibrate, we need to pull back a little bit. So I believe it can be uh, learned in famine, but I also believe that contentment can be learned in feast, okay? What I mean by this is that when there is an abundance of wealth, right, when there is an abundance of blessing that is flowing in our lives, that doesn't mean that a person is just automatically, uh, you know, content or discontent. That's not what it means. It's not an automatic thing. It's all about the attitude of the heart and the attitude of the mind. I believe that when blessing flows and abundance flows, that we can learn contentment by our generosity and by our gratitude. I believe that if we will discipline ourselves to be a people that give out of what God has blessed us with, it will create a sense of calm and contentment that floods our soul. I don't think there's anything wrong with having a lot of money. I think there's something wrong when money has me, okay? And there's a difference between those two things. Ironically, okay, here's the ironic part. It often seems that when provision flows into our lives is when we seem the most discontent. Have you noticed that? It's often when we have an abundance of finances that we want more stuff, right? This is what we call uh, the Diderot effect, okay? So in the 1700s, there's this writer philosopher, his name is Dennis Diderot. He, uh, he was basically, he grew up in poverty most of his life. And when he was in his early 50s, his daughter was going to get married, but he didn't have enough money to put a down payment on the facility, all these kind of things. But he had been a contributor to writing like the encyclopedia during, during this era. And so uh, he had his own library and all these kind of things, but he was still basically living in, po in poverty. And so because of his work in the encyclopedia, there was a, a lady who was you know, a political leader. She heard about his plight and in an effort to appreciate his work that he had done in the encyclopedia, she goes and she purchases his library for $50,000, right? Which in that day was a, I mean, it's still a lot of money, but it was a tremendous, like, you don't have to worry about anything else for the rest of your life. You got 50 grand in, you know, the 1700s. And so she buys it for $50,000 and he has all this wealth all of a sudden in his mid fifties. And so he's able to take care of his daughter's wedding and all of this kind of thing. Well, in the midst of this, he goes out and one of the very first purchases he makes is he buys a scarlet robe. Okay, you ever seen a philosopher with like a pipe and a robe? It was that kind of thing is the scarlet, you know, this red, beautiful robe. And he wore the robe off and it was very, very beautiful. And then all of a sudden, as he took his robe and he hung it on his coat rack in his apartment or, or house, whatever it was, as he hung it there, he took a step back one day. He looked at the robe and he looked at everything else in his small living space and all of a sudden, everything else began to look ugly, right? He started looking at his rug, and he's like, man, I just don't know. Like, the, the, the robe clashes with the rug. I'm definitely not getting rid of the robe, but I got to do something about this rug, 
You know, and so he goes and he takes the rug, he rolls it up and he goes and he buys like a new rug from Damascus, you know, this beautiful, gorgeous rug. And he takes a step back and he's like, yeah, that's beautiful. The robe and the rug is beautiful, but man, it just feels like I don't have enough art in, in this place. You know, I need, to, I need to sophisticate this a little bit. So he goes and he begins to buy these sculptures and decorate his apartment. He buys uh, this beautiful, like full length mirror and he goes out and he takes his old chair that, you know, he probably wrote most of the encyclopedia in. He takes it and he throws it out and he goes and buys a brand new leather lazy boy, you know, and he, he puts it all in his house and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, there we go. This everything, everything is actually good at this point. And basically the essence, the reason that we call it the Diderot effect is, is this. The Diderot effect is basically when I acquire something that's new there's something inside of me that says I have to accessorize this thing a little bit more. Okay, I'll give you an example. Okay, so for me, I've mentioned a thousand times, I, I enjoy bow hunting. Okay, I've been saving money for a year. I want to buy a new bow. Okay, um, I have one, but it's like, you know, 25 years old. And so I need, I need a new bow. I want a new bow. Okay, here we go. So I want to go get this new bow. I've been saving all this money, all this kind of thing. So I'm looking, I'm kind of like narrowing my focus. I kind of want this. But then I realize I'm like, well, if I get a new bow, I, I, I really probably need a new stabilizer for the bow, right? I look at it, I'm like, yeah, that's good. That'll, that'll probably do. And then I look at it, I'm like, but this new sight that they have, it's not three pin or five pin or four pin. It's a single pin and it like has this dial on it. It's super sophisticated, super accurate. I probably need to go ahead and upgrade the, the, the sight as well. They have these new releases that are no longer just like a finger, but it's the thumb and it's just a little bit more efficient, a little bit more zip and all this thing. I probably need that. I need new arrows, obviously. I'm not gonna shoot old arrows on a new bow. And if I get new I probably need new broadheads because mine, I bought them like, you know, three years ago and they got a little bit of blood and rust on them. So I need to get, you know, some, some new. And all of a sudden, this purchase of a bow and arrow has exploded into this, you know, multi hundred dollar expense of all these things that something inside of me says, you also need these things as well, right? This is like when a lady goes and buys a new dress, Right? She's like, oh, this dress is so beautiful. She looks in the mirror, and all of a sudden she notices in the mirror that her nails aren't done. And she's like, I can't wear this dress with these nails. Right? So she goes down, she gets her nails done, and then she goes back in the mirror, she looks again, and she's like, oh, this is so beautiful. My nails, they match. And all of a sudden she's like, I, I can't wear these heels with these nails in this dress. And so she goes down and she buys new heels. You understand what I'm saying? And it just it becomes this thing where when we have one thing that we thought would satisfy us to the hilt, we had this one thing that we just knew would kind of zip that thing out of us. We get it, but we're still not satisfied. We've got to build it out. There's got to be more. There's this insatiable desire within us. This is what we call the Diderot effect. It's something that when we are living in abundance, we feel like we have to have more and more and more. This is where our society is right now. We live in one of the most decadent societies that has ever existed on the planet. There is such abundance, but people are more discontent now than they have ever been in the scope of human history. And it's because they haven't learned the secret, what Paul said, the secret of what it means to be content. This is what Diderot would say. He would say at, at the end of all this, as he began to, to understand all this about himself, he said, let my example teach you a lesson. Poverty has its freedoms. In other words, he's saying there are some good things that we need to learn from being in a state of poverty, but opulence or, or abundance also has its obstacles. So he's saying that riches aren't all it's cracked up to be. What he is getting at, I believe, is this, is that we need to be a people, whether we're in feast or whether we're in famine, we need to be a people that learn what it means to be content, to be good with what we have, not constantly coveting and wanting what other people have, but to be content with it. And then finally, number three, I believe that contentment can be learned based out of this text. Contentment can be learned in friendships. Okay. Notice how Paul, he begins, he's talking about this gift that they've given and, you know, what it means to be content. I've had a lot. I've had nothing, all this kind of thing. But then at the very end, he begins, he like pivots his focus and he starts talking about 
his needs and desires and all this, but he says, I'm not saying this because I want something from you, but I'm saying this because I want you to receive the reward that you should be given. And he begins this little, you know, this little speech about how great they've been and how good they've been. All that Paul is doing is this, is he's shifting his focus from saying, I've had little, I've had a lot, I've learned the secret of being content. He's showing us how to be content. Part of the way that we are content is by generously giving to other people. Compliments and love and finances, if that's what is abundant. All of these types of things, Paul is shifting the focus and he's focusing on them. This is what the writer of Proverbs says. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. That's not always financial. But he's saying when abundance flows in your life, don't just consume it all for yourself, but look to your friends, look to your family, look to those who aren't living in abundance and bless them. And as you do that, it will keep you within the frame of contentment because you're not self-absorbed on all of these things. This is what Paul calls the secret of contentment. I think that Paul, his secret, although I think he kept it you know, pretty vague for us, I think that Paul's secret of contentment was simply this. I think it was appreciating what he had on earth, whether it was a lot or a little, he appreciated it. There was gratitude there, you know. But I think to build upon that secret, I think it was that, but I also thought that Paul had like a heavenly gaze. I think that Paul understood the secret of contentment is all this stuff's gonna burn, right? All of this stuff is gonna be ash one day. None of this stuff is of eternal value. And while I appreciate it in this moment, my eyes are set on something far higher, something that's eternal. I think Job shared this type of contentment even in the loss of almost everything that he ever owned. Listen to what he said in Job 1.21. He said, I came naked from my mother's womb and I will leave naked as well. The Lord gave me what I had. The Lord gave me abundance and the Lord has taken it away. The Lord has caused famine, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Paul's perspective, whether, whether feast or whether famine, I'm grateful none of it matters because there's coming a day that's eternal where my soul will be with the Lord. I believe that those two elements are Paul's secret to contentment. Amen. Amen. Amen.